Hey friends, welcome to Doxology, Praise and Prayer in the Psalms. I know God's got a lot in store for us today, so let's jump right in. So how about grab a cup of coffee and a pencil and your Bible and a workbook, and let's get going. Come on, follow me. Hey friends, I'm Jason Collins. I'm the pastor here at St. Paul's Church in Conway, South Carolina, and I want to welcome you again to Doxology, Praise and Prayer in the Psalms. I'm really excited about what this six-week study can do for you because I read the Psalms almost every day, and they have blessed me over the years, and I know they're going to bless you. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we jump into our teaching. First of all, you're going to need a Bible, and you can use a hard copy, or I like to read the Bible on my iPad, so you're going to need that. You're going to need your workbook that the church provided for you. You're probably going to need a pen or a pencil, and just a great, comfortable place for you to sit in and enjoy the teaching. So we're going to do an introduction today to explain the entire book of Psalms, which will set you up for success as we study individual Psalms over the next six-week period. So follow along with me in your workbook, and you'll see there's some fill-in-the-blank spaces, and you can fill those spaces in as I do the teaching. So let's jump right in, and I can't wait to see what God's going to do. So first of all, the first question that we need to ask ourselves is this. You know, the Psalms are in the Bible. They were written thousands of years ago by a variety of different authors, and they were all members of the people of Israel. So here we are in Conway, South Carolina in the 21st century. So why in the world would we read the Psalms? What in the world do they mean for us, and why are they so important, and why have they blessed so many people over the years? Well, that's a great question because the Psalms are a collection of Hebrew poems that have been written over a long period of time. But the great German reformer Martin Luther summarized it best when he said, we read the book of Psalms because in the Psalms we find a summary of the entire Bible. So it's worth reading. If you understand the Psalms, you will understand the rest of the scripture. So that's why we read the Psalms today. One of the reasons that we read the Psalms is because the Psalms are so rich, they're so deep. They describe every possible human emotion that you and I could ever experience. From the heights of joy to the depths of despair, it's all there. It's just, it explains the human experiences of life. Another reason we read the Psalms is because the Psalms give us comfort. It comforts us to know that God is with us and He loves us and He will protect us and He will guard us and guide us. And we find all that in the Psalms. Another reason we read the Psalms is because they help us to learn about God and who God is and what He has done for us. But the Psalms also teach us a lot about ourselves, about our own human nature, about our own fallenness and our own need for God. So it's really worth our time invested in reading the Psalms. Another great example of the reason we read the Psalms is because the Psalms teach us how to talk with God. And if you read the Psalms prayerfully and listen, you can actually sometimes hear God speaking back to you in the Psalms. So it's well worth our time. And again, the Psalms are really going to bless you, especially as I show you how to read them prayerfully. So. One of the reasons the Psalms are so popular and we still read them in church today is because the Psalms were actually the first hymns. The book of Psalms was the hymnal for the people of Israel. In fact, many of the Psalms were written by David, who was a talented musician and a songwriter and a shepherd before he became the second king of Israel. The Psalms were meant to be sung in worship, and they've been sung in both Jewish synagogues and in the Jewish temple and in Christian churches for over 3,000 years. In fact, even today in some churches, only Psalms can be sung. If you sung something other than a Psalm, that was considered heresy. That was not a good thing to do. So for instance, maybe this will strike a bell with you. A mighty fortress is our God. That's Psalm 46. Or how about this hymn? O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. If you've ever sung that psalm in church, that's Psalm 90. Or in a little more contemporary way, how about this one? Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house.
else there is one day in your course and thousands elsewhere that's psalm 84. or how about this one bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name we sing that in church a lot and that is psalm 103. So it's very possible that you've been singing the Psalms your whole life and maybe you didn't even know it. Another reason to study the book of Psalms. Another reason that the Psalms have been so popular over 3,000 years is that the Psalms are prayers. In fact, when the Psalms were collected, they became the first prayer book, the prayer book of the people of Israel, which became the prayer book of the Christian church. Just like we use the Book of Common Prayer in the Anglican Church, the Psalms have been the prayer book for thousands of years. In fact, the Hebrew title for the Book of Psalms is Telahim, which means praise or prayer. So the Psalms are a handbook for prayer. They teach us how to talk to God and how to listen for God to respond. We also read the Psalms because they record historical events of the people of Israel. And some of the Psalms uh, record things like the Exodus and crossing the Red Sea and leaving Egypt. And other Psalms are specific historic accounts from events in the life of King David and other people. We also read the book of Psalms because they contain prophecy. Some of the prophecy contained in the Psalms has already been fulfilled and, and much has been fulfilled in Jesus. There is also another portion of the Psalms that contain prophecy that has not been fulfilled yet. And Jesus will fulfill that prophecy when he returns again. One great reason why the Christian church continues to read the Psalms in church is that Jesus knew the Psalms. Jesus prayed the Psalms. Jesus sang the Psalms. Jesus also quoted the Psalms when he was teaching his disciples about what it meant to follow him. So it should not surprise us that Jesus' disciples also quoted the Psalms when they taught other people to follow Jesus and when they wrote the letters and the books that were assembled into what we now call the New Testament. So there are lots of great reasons to read the Psalms, and I hope you'll discover more during this six-week study. So one of the things that's unusual about the book of Psalms is that they were written by more than one person. Every other book of the Bible was essentially written by a solo author, and yet the Psalms were written by groups of people over many hundreds of years. So let's talk about who some of the authors were and why that's important. Well, first of all, King David is credited with writing almost half of the 150 Psalms. David is credited with 73 of them, and David was a musician and a singer and a songwriter even before he was the king of Israel. Another author in the Psalms that we know is a man named Asaph, and Asaph wrote 12 Psalms. And Asaph was one of the lead singers and the lead musicians in the temple praise ensemble uh, in Jerusalem in the temple. Uh, another group of Psalms was written by a collection of people called the Sons of Korah. They wrote 11 Psalms, and the Sons of Korah were members of the priestly tribe of Levi, and they were descended from Moses' nephew, Korah. Uh, King Solomon, who was David's son, Solomon wrote two psalms, and they're found uh, in the collection of 150 psalms. A man named Heman the Ezrahite, he is credited with writing one psalm, and along with Asaph, Heman was one of the main musicians and singers and songwriters in the temple. Ethan the Ezraite also wrote one psalm, and Ethan was paired up with Heman and Asaph, and they were, again, they were the lead singers and musicians in the temple. Moses wrote one psalm. In fact, Moses wrote Psalm 90 after the people of Israel were delivered from slavery in Egypt. So Psalm 90 is actually the oldest psalm in the Bible. And then 50 psalms are anonymous. We don't know who wrote them. Uh, but it doesn't matter because they all ultimately point us back to God. Another interesting thing about the book of Psalms is there actually is some structure to it. However, the Psalms, if we have received them in the Bible, have been uh, arranged and rearranged several different times before we have them in the order that we have them now. In fact, one thing uh, that's important to remember is that the Psalms are not in chronological order. For instance, uh, when David 
uh, was confronted with his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of Bathsheba's husband, he confessed his sins to God in Psalm 51. However, in Psalm 34, David records the fact that he realized that God answered his prayer and has forgiven him. So they're out of order in that sense. However, over the years, the Psalms have been structured in an order that is based loosely on the themes of the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. For instance, the introduction to the Psalms is basically Psalms 1 and 2. Then book one it contains uh, psalms that are based around the themes that you find in the book of Genesis. Book two, which is Psalms 42 to 72, uh, are based on the themes in Exodus. Psalms 73 to 89, those are based on the themes that you find in Leviticus. And then Psalms 90 to 106 are based around the themes that you would find in the book of Numbers. Finally, Psalms 107 to 145 are loosely based on the themes that you would find in the book of Deuteronomy. And then at the very end, Psalms 146 to 150 is a conclusion of praise. And so there is some structure to the Psalms. They're just not structured like you might think they would be. Finally, one thing to notice as you read through the Psalms is after each one of these books, the authors have inserted a doxology. Each of the five books closes with a doxology. And that gives us the name of our study, doxology, praise and prayer in the Psalms. In fact, the word doxology comes from two Greek words, doxa, which means praise, and logia, which means words. So a doxology is a word of praise, and each uh, book of the Psalms ends with a word of praise to the Lord. There's actually even more structure that we find in the book of Psalms and in the fact that some Psalms are collected together in subcategories and those subcategories of Psalms were used uh, for special events. For instance, the Hallel Psalms were Psalms that were used to celebrate the Feast of the Passover. And so all of those Psalms in that subcategory, they begin and end with the word Hallelujah and Hallel is the root. Hallel means praise, so hallelujah means praise the Lord. So each of those psalms begin and end with those words. Another subcategory are known as the Psalms of Ascent. And uh, if you know your geography, you know that Jerusalem is in the Mount Zion mountain range. And then the Temple Mount, well, that the temple was built on top of, was called Mount Moriah. And so for Jewish pilgrims to go to the temple to worship, they had to ascend from all directions. And so the Psalms of Ascent were Psalms that were collected together and used by Jewish pilgrims as they ascended up the mountain range to go and worship God in the temple. There's another subcategory called historical psalms, and that group of psalms records very specific events in the history of the people of Israel. One other thing to remember when you read the psalms is that although the psalms are certainly divinely inspired scripture, they're also literature because they were recorded in a book. And so psalms as literature, they have literary genres or themes that you will find throughout. For instance, some psalms are hymns of praise, while others are laments, which is a way to express terrible grief. Other psalms are royal psalms, and they talk about the coming king or blessings for the king. Some psalms are prayers of thanksgiving, thanking God for his many, many blessings. Other psalms contain wisdom, other psalms contain history, and some psalms are actually uh, acrostic poems that means each beginning word of every verse begins with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So there is a, a pretty good bit of structure in the Psalms that you wouldn't notice, especially in acrostic poem, because you and I use the English alphabet. We don't use the Hebrew alphabet. But there is some very important structure that you find in the book of Psalms. There's one more feature that I want you to notice as you read the Psalms, and that is the, uh, something that you'll see in Psalms that are laments, expression of grief. Uh, many times the psalmist is just crying out and pouring their heart out to God. And it seems like nothing's ever going to get better. Everything's falling apart. The world is miserable. And yet there's something that happens, and it usually is marked with two three-letter words, but or yet. 
And after those words, the psalmist totally changes direction. And what started out in a lament oftentimes turns into words of praise and trust in God. And so I like to refer to those special three-letter words, but and yet as the turn, the, the theme, the tone, the mood of the psalm totally turns from lament and crying out to trusting in God. All right, so it may feel like we have covered a lot of territory, and we have, and yet in many ways we have just touched the tip of the iceberg because there were so much richness in the 150 Psalms that you find in the Bible. So I just want to encourage you to stick with it, dig deeper, keep reading, keep studying and praying, and let's see what God is going to reveal to you in these next six weeks. Speaking of that, I want to tell you how to get the most out of this study of doxology, praise, and prayer in the Psalms. Once you read the Psalms, uh, there's two different features that I want to teach you that you'll find in your workbook to get the most out of this study. The first thing is we want to teach you the SOAP method of Bible study, S-O-A-P. And the SOAP is an acronym for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. And so as you look at these Psalms, as you read the Psalms in your own personal Bible study, I want you to do this. First S, Scripture. Read the Scripture carefully, prayerfully, and slowly, looking for things, listening for God to speak. The second letter, O, stands for observation. What do you notice after you've read the psalm several times, carefully and prayerfully? What does it mean? Third letter, A, is for application. How can you apply what you've read in the psalm to your life? Because if you don't apply it, then the psalms are only information and not transformation. So how can you apply what you've learned? And then finally, P is for prayer. How do you respond in prayer? And we're going to show you a three-step method for praying, but also for writing your prayers so you can go back and read them again. And that is called the TSP method. And that stands for thank you, sorry, please. So you can start off by thanking God for something that he's pointed out to you in the Psalms. Then perhaps maybe he's shown you something that you need to repent of and be sorry for. And so you can tell him that you're sorry for that. And then please, please, Lord, give me what I need to make it through the day or to make it through life or to whatever your needs might be. Offer them up to the Lord and watch him answer them for you. So that's the SOAP message, S-O-A-P, and that will help you to prayerfully read and learn more from the Psalms. The second step that we're going to teach you in this method is called digging deeper. And after the SOAP method and after you read the Psalms, there's going to be some, some bullet points and some numbered questions and things to point you into the deeper meaning of the Psalm. For instance, uh, after the teaching, there will be a category called something to ponder. It's a key word or key phrase for you to think about uh, over the week. There's going to be a key point, which is a very important main theme in the psalm that you should not forget. A third category is called biblical resource. And the Bible does not contradict itself. It cross-references itself. And so we're going to give you other scripture passages that will help explain what you've already read in the Psalms. A fourth category is prophecy. And some of the Psalms contain prophecy that have been fulfilled. Some Psalms contain prophecy that will be fulfilled in the future. The fifth category is one I'm especially excited about. It's called Strengthen Your Family. And this is a way for you to use what you've learned in the Psalms to strengthen your relationship with your family, with your spouse, with your children, with your grandchildren, and to teach the faith to the next generation. So we want to equip you with that tool to pass the faith along to others. And then finally, because the Psalms have been sung over the years and the Psalms have inspired other songs, we're going to point out some songs that you may be familiar with that you've been singing your whole life that those Psalms have inspired. And I think that will just encourage you to read the Psalms and to remember the Psalms when you hear them when they're sung. So I want to go ahead and encourage you to read Lesson 1, which you'll find in your workbook, and read Psalm 121 for next week. Go ahead and read the psalm prayerfully. Take your pencil and make notes. You can highlight, you can write in the workbook or in the Bible. 
and then spend a little bit of time going through the SOAP method, digging deeper and making notes and answering the questions in your workbook so you'll be fully prepared for some engaging discussion questions and fellowship time uh, when we all gather next week. So with that, that's a great introduction to doxology praise and prayer in the Psalms. I am excited because I love the Psalms and I'm excited for you and I can't wait to see what God does to you and for you and in you as you continue to study doxology, praise and prayer in the Psalms. So hang in there with us and there are more to come next week. God bless you all.